Thank you for listening to Depictions Media Radio. Welcome to Policy and Rights, the show about government policy and human rights. Welcome back to Policy and Race here in Depictions Media Radio. I'm your host, Michael Cloggs, and we're going to have updates from the BBC News uh, that appeared in our email. Um, first uh, is rescuers go through death and rubble in Gaza. Um, Gaza City has been designated on Wednesday as a dangerous combat zone by Israeli forces who called all residents to evacuate south. Rescue workers in Gaza's civil defense say they often struggle to identify victims killed in the conflict. Um, There are other updates. Uh, If we go to the BBC uh, News uh, website on um, Gaza City, and uh, Rafa in other areas where people are going through the rubble and hopefully uh, can start a rebuilding process without the fighting continuing. So uh, more from from that. Um, and... Uh, President Biden, uh, of course, is um, up for talking about. Uh, he, apparently, he had made a some some sort of uh, of a verbal flubber again, and people are um, are once again questioning uh, Biden's um, validity as as a um, presidential candidate and saying, asking if his mental uh, qualifications are still there. I do want to say this, and yes, I am a fan of President Joe Biden and not a fan at all of uh, former President Donald Trump. That no one has called the question the fact that um, Mr. Trump needs help walking to the podium because he he's having trouble walking on his own. No one calls into question when Mr. Trump makes a verbal flubber. So why is the the mass media actually going after President Joe Biden when he makes a a, a bit of a flubber? If we're going to go after one, then go after the other. It would seem that that this should be a equal stakes um, situation, but it would seem that that the mass media seems to be kind of stacked against Mr. Biden and going very much so pro Donald Trump, which could be a very big mistake for the people that live in the United States that maybe Mr. Trump is not the best person and maybe the Biden administration is far superior to anything that Donald Trump can put up so a little bit of a rant about about that sort of thing 
Uh, at the NATO summit, summit uh, the chaotic situation with uh, in the Democratic Party is playing out against a backdrop of high-level meetings focused on Ukraine's future. Uh, President Biden, in a press conference uh, Thursday afternoon, uh, was keenly watched, and they're looking for for results and. Mr. Biden has made several promises to President Zelensky in the forms of aid, um, training, and weapons, as well um, that is in conjunction with some of the Canadian promises that were made uh, for uh, military aid to help repel the Russian attackers. course moving forward um, and a update on, on um, the situation between the US and Germany they are coming to an agreement um, Washington and Berlin announced a long-range US missile missiles would be deployed periodically in Germany from 2026 for the first time since the Cold War. The joint U.S.-German statement issued at NATO's 75th anniversary summit made it clear uh, the deployment of the missiles was originally seen as a temporary but could become permanent. So, um, as the United States and Germany become closer and closer allies. So, why don't we move forward to today's segments, and today's segments we're going to be um, hearing from the Health Minister of Canada as he's talking about uh, dental plans, and we're also going to hear a significant um happening in the Green Party as the uh, deputy leader of the Green Party is stepping down for personal reasons. So why don't we listen to, to that as it played out a few days ago. Okay, our first segment is going to be uh, from Calgary, Alberta. As Inter Energy Minister Brian Jean signs a carbon sequestration agreement with Shell and ATCO, the deal allows the two companies to store carbon dioxide underground in a carbon storage hub um, 45 kilometers east of Edmonton and is part of a first phase of the province's plan to decarbonize the in energy industry. Good morning, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us today. I'm pleased to be joined by Susanna Pierce, and uh, she is the president and count country chair of Shell Canada. Also, Bob Miles, someone you know well, Chief Operating Officer for ATCO Empower. They're here for this announcement, which is a very exciting day indeed for Alberta. As you may know, our province is actually a globally recognized leader in the CCUS, the carbon capture, utilization, and storage of carbon. In fact, we're moving as quickly as anywhere in the world to develop this technology, and we're doing a great job with our industry partners. We've invested billions of dollars into projects and programs as well as regulatory improvements that have streamlined and make things a lot better, as well as knowledge sharing. These efforts have proven extremely successful. The world is watching, they have taken notice, and they see what we're doing. For example, the Quest and Alberta Trunk Line projects have captured and stored more than 12 million tons of carbon dioxide since starting operations. CCUS is the most viable option for hard to abate industries such as oil and gas, power generation, hydrogen, petrochemicals, and cement. These need to significantly reduce their emissions and it's much more difficult to do so. In order to reach 
our emissions targets and to ensure a sustainable energy sector, we need to expand our CCUS network right across the province. That's why we're developing carbon storage hubs. These hubs will allow operators such as Atlas to safely collect, transport and permanently store emissions from industries in that region. Development of the hubs actually started in 2022 and has been moving very quickly. But government couldn't be making the progress that we have on hub development as a world leader by itself. We've been working closely with industry every step of the way, including both Shell and ATCO. Today, we are truly making history right here in this room by celebrating the signing of the first carbon sequestration agreement in our province with the Atlas Project. It's amazing, the very first carbon sequestration agreement in our province. Something a lot of people don't know is the geological potential of Alberta. We certainly have all the competitive advantages right here to lead the world in this technology. And this signing marks the next stage of hub development. Until now, projects were only evaluating the suitability of their locations to store carbon dioxide. With this agreement, Atlas will now have the right to inject and store captured carbon dioxide at their proposed storage hub location. In addition, they can now proceed to the next stage and apply for regulatory approvals. Alberta? Well, we're very serious about meeting our emissions targets and reaching net zero by 2050. We want to do everything possible to support our industry partners in this work. And I want to personally thank Shell and ATCO and power for their interest in this technology. Their leadership in shaping this energy sector and their dedication to this process is what's making this possible. I'm confident that we are witnessing the first of what will be many other agreements of this nature. We have, pro we have proven time and time again that Alberta has the knowledge, the talent, and the will to make great things happen. And it's why people want to live and work right here and raise their family in Alberta. Thank you for joining us today. I'd now like to invite Susanna Pierce, the President and Country Chair of Shell Canada, from Shell, to say a few words. Thank you, Susanna, and thank you for being here. Thank you. Well, hello, everybody. In the spirit of reconciliation, I'd like to start by acknowledging that we live, work, and play, and we're signing here today in the traditional territories of the Blackfoot Confederacy, the Siksika, the Kainai, and the Pikani, the Sutina, the Stony Dakota Nations, Chiniki, Bearspaw, Good Stony, and the Métis governments, Districts 5 and 6, and of course all of us who make our homes in the Treaty 7 region of Southern Alberta. We are immensely grateful to be here today to celebrate this important milestone in Alberta's, ACO's, and Shell's CCS journeys. CCS has the potential to be a generational opportunity for the province, creating the possibility for significant new economic development while providing a pathway to address emissions for decades to come using proven technologies that are available now. The CCS framework Alberta has worked to develop, including the carbon sequestration agreement we are signing today, has set a very strong foundation for this nascent industry to grow, providing the regulatory certainty needed to unlock investment while ensuring meaningful rules are in place to protect the needs of Albertans now and into the future. We are very proud to have announced our final investment decision on the Atlas Carbon Storage Hub a few weeks ago alongside our partner, ACO. We are also very proud to have announced Atlas's first customer, Shell's Polaris Project, which is designed to capture approximately 650,000 tonnes of CO2 per year from the Shell-owned Scotford Refinery and Chemicals Complex. Both Polaris and Atlas build on the success of Shell's Quest CCS facility at Scotford, which has safely captured and stored more than 9 million tonnes of CO2 since 2015. Our intent is to use our experience in CCS to work with even more customers on sequestering CO2 through the Atlas hub in the years to come. Our ability to move forward with Polaris and Atlas would not have been possible without the supportive policy frameworks Alberta and the federal government have implemented, the CCOS Investment Tax Credit and the Alberta Carbon Capture Incentive Program, in particular, were instrumental in our decision to invest. Alberta has already established itself as a world leader in CCS due in large part to the hard work of you and your team, Minister Dean. We thank you for all you've done to make today possible 
and look forward to our continued work together in advancing this next chapter of CCS in the province. And I'd also like to close in thanking our partner, ACCO, for all the due diligence that we've worked on together since we started working on together, and of course the Shell team, some of whom are represented here today and some of whom are not. Thank you so much. Thank you, Susanna, and thank you, Minister Jean. Definitely a pleasure to be here with everyone today. Progress, like our agreement today, is proof that Alberta is at the forefront of the energy transition. The Atlas Carbon Storage Hub is a meaningful step forward for a successful energy future for this province and for Canada. The collaboration between our provincial government, Shell, and the local communities underscores the joint dedication needed to actively create a lower carbon future. By investing in these technologies and infrastructure, Alberta is positioning itself as a leader in the global fight against climate change while ensuring that local industries and communities thrive. What Susanna said made me think back a couple weeks ago. We were on a call with our partner, one of our partners in Japan, and we had just made our press release for, for our Atlas project. And our partner put up, and it was in the, the media that day in, in Tokyo, they put up what I couldn't understand because it was in Japanese, but it was an announcement of our project. So not only is this important for Alberta, for Canada, but it actually is being viewed globally. So it was quite impressive. At ATCO NPower, we are actively working across all aspects of the energy transition value chain with investments in renewable power generation, energy storage, hydrogen, hydrogen derivatives, and now carbon capture and storage. We're deeply honored to be partnering on the Atlas Carbon Storage Hub. I'd like to acknowledge the ongoing support of the Government of Alberta and the deep expertise of our partner at Shell. We really appreciate our partnership with Shell. Today's announcement is a testament to our belief that achieving a lower carbon future is not just a responsibility, but an opportunity. At ATCO and Power, we will continue to explore innovative energy solutions for a sustainable world. Thank you, and back to you, Minister. Well, folks, that is great news indeed. I think uh, a lot of people don't realize how important this actually is, and I'd like to thank you both and thank your respective companies and, and in fact, the government team as well because they have been, uh, they've certainly shown initiative and it's good to see all hands on board. So um, now I'd like to invite you, uh, please, and we'll be signing the documents officially. And then we'll take questions. Thank you. I guess we've got mics right here. Do these mics work? Good. Um, any questions? Happy to take questions on this. Uh, we will take questions. Uh, we, we'll begin in the room. It'll be one question, one follow, uh, and then we will go to the uh, to the phone line. See if there's anybody there. Uh, but if uh, you'd state your name and your news organization that you're with, uh, we'll begin in the room here. So just make your way over to the mic, and that would be great. Sean Polzer, Western Standard. Um, I guess uh, for any of you guys. Um, so Minister Wilkinson was in town last week, and uh, I put the question to him specifically about the Shell and ACCO announcement. And uh, he made a comment that uh, technology alone is not a silver bullet, and that just because you have the technology, that doesn't necessarily mean that there's business case. So I'm, I guess I'm putting to you, what is the business case? How much investment do you think this will eventually drive? And uh, you talked about 
even more announcements uh, to come. How many do you think that we could see? Well, first of all, you're right. Uh, it doesn't just take a dream, it takes action. And we're seeing action here today by the Alberta government and, and both by these uh, two great corporate citizens, we're seeing action. Um, you know, we're going to see a number of uh, projects be announced over the coming months. Um, we'll see how many, but, uh, you know, we're obviously, we've reached a point where we've got a, a standard uh, set of principles and documents for this particular endeavor and we have some very senior uh, multinational corporations that know what they're doing and I, I think it certainly shows that Alberta can uh, form great partnerships that are going to be very good for Alberta, for Canada and the world and that's exactly what we're doing. We're making, uh, we're making it clear that it's about action. Please. Sure, and I'll just add that, you know, indeed technology that we're using is proven. Uh, it's been proven here also in Alberta. How did you CCS? From our perspective, we see it as an important part of our strategy to decarbonize. It's certainly an important part of decarbonizing industrial emissions as we see it under the Paris Agreement. For Shell, it's also something where we see this as something customers want, which is why we're partnering with ATCO to invite customers to sequester their emissions, you know, in our hub. And then finally, what we also see here in Alberta and federally is supportive regulatory and fiscal frameworks, which is another critical component for this project to move forward. Sean, Sean right? Yeah. The only thing I'd add to that, because I agree with the comments that have been made, is just the, the global, you know, kind of view and perspective on all of this. Is This is one component to be able to not only capture CO2, but also to enhance and to, and develop a, an industry globally and so when I look at Southeast Asia there's a lot of interest in what we're doing here and the economics there do make sense and there's a lot of government support in other jurisdictions as well. And some, um, if I can Sean just very quickly some things uh, people don't understand is that uh, Alberta is probably the best jurisdiction in the world to do it not only from a regulatory and legal standpoint but also just the geology and the expertise here we are world leading and we intend to stay there. When we talk about the economics, um, there's some criticism that uh, maybe it's too expensive. Um, what, are, what are some of your response to that? Like, w would we see costs coming down over time? It, you know, I, ma I imagine, is it kind of like one of those falling hockey sticks? Uh, for certain. I mean, in all thing projects like this, we've seen the oil and gas sector uh, be, be successful and they have over time cut costs in almost every performance indicator so there's no question costs will come down over time and make it much more economical but there is also the other question what can we do with uh, with this uh, asset that we're storing in the ground and I say asset because it is an asset right now Heidelberg's using it to make uh, cement more solid there's other opportunities for use around the world right now and, and there's more uh, R&D taking place in relation to the uses that we could have for this carbon so this is an asset and we see this as a future asset for the people of Alberta and the people of Canada yeah I would agree with that I think even with Quest alone we've identified some capital cost efficiencies so the more that we develop the technology the more that we learn how we do it more effectively the more we become more efficient with our capital and costs will go down I just, I kind of agree totally with what Susanna is saying as one of the things that we really considered when we were looking for a partner is the expertise that Shell brought to this and the learnings that Shell had from their Quest project. So I do think the costs have come down over the last decade. We think there's, there's opportunities to bring the cost down further as we move forward. Thank you. Right. Next question. Uh, Kyle Bax of CBC. Uh, Minister, I was just wondering, are there, other, are there considerations right now for other incentives or changes to the tier program or other policies to encourage more of these proposals to, to be greenlit? Well, at this stage, we obviously can see the effect and result of our action. It seems to be working. Uh, we have a great agreement with, uh, as I said, two excellent corporations that um, our leading edge and I think what we're going to see right now is a continuation of signing and uh, opportunities that people see around the world. We, we heard cl clearly from Susanna that there is an opportunity as a commercialization um, project and that there is the numbers make sense and uh, and frankly I, I believe that we're going to see a, a number of actors come forward and say you know this is where the world's going. There is the demand in, in Asia as has been mentioned. I saw it firsthand in Korea and Japan. Uh, they are very, very interested in our, our products and in particular how we can uh, sequester carbon. 
And then a question for you, Bob. Um, how, there are dozens of these projects that are proposed. How many of them do you think are going to go ahead, and what's kind of the critical factor in that will make or break a proposal? Well, for, from my point of view, I do think there's a lot that are being proposed. I'm a, I'm a huge believer that industry needs to work together. I think we need to probably build fewer, not as many as, as are being proposed. But I think the more we can actually work together, the better for all of industry. I, I, I'm a, I've always been a believer in things like this. Get out in front of this. And I think we have as Atlas. I think there's a lot of attention to what we're doing. And I do hope that we can bring some other, you know, hubs together and in, in to, to help the overall economy. I don't think it makes economic sense to build as many as are being proposed. But I think you'd look at every industry that is, that's ever been developed. It starts off with a lot, and then the ones that are the most economic are the ones that are actually going to proceed. Okay. Next question. Hi, Chris Farco with the Calgary Herald. Um, maybe we can just start off with a bit of a technical question here, but we had the announcement from the province a couple of years ago about all of these hubs getting, I guess, the rights to this. Can you explain exactly what is the process that has allowed you to get to this stage and what do you still need to do? Because you talked about the fact that you've still got to do some regulatory filings before you actually begin to store the CO2. So could you just, somebody could explain that. I can start. Yes, so the sequestration lease agreement, again, is the agreement with the government so that we can sequester the emissions. And we worked very hard ever since it was announced to really bring it to an agreement where we could all come together. But now we do have to go through the permitting process and make sure that's in place, as well as, as a hub, begin to market to customers. So those are the two next steps that need to follow this. Okay. Up to now, it's more been a feasibility issue. And, and, uh, and frankly, uh, we're, we're set to go. And one of the jurisdictional advantages we have is the flexibility of our regulatory system and how we've responded to this. We have, we've set up 25 major hubs, but we've also set up small and remote hub opportunities for proponents so that they can have the flexibility to, to meet the economic needs, but also uh, the geological needs of where they are. So we're trying to help them as much as we possibly can in saving costs, but also um, making sure that on a long-term basis we have a really good industry that is flexible and adaptable and also profitable. Okay, and this is a question for all three of you, but this is your project on uh, on Polaris and Atlas is the first or one of the first CCUS projects that's been announced in the last couple of years. Now this is going to be the first hub. So I guess what do you think the signal is on whether we're going to on what it's going to take to get more of these projects across the finish line, particularly when it looks like and we saw this with Capital Power, some projects and some proponents have simply walked away and said that the incentives and that the proper economics are not there. Sure, I can start. Um, mostly I'll say this first comment because of the other part of my business is generation. And I know when you look at Capital Power, not to, not to really get into their business, but it was not just a carbon capture and sequestration. It was also a, a power project that they were pursuing. But for, for our projects, we, we do believe that energy transition will occur. We could sit here and argue at great lengths as to how quickly it will occur, but I think we, we will agree that it is happening and we want to be the first in, to get in front of this. So we do think the economics do make a lot of sense for many projects. doesn't mean it makes sense for, for everybody, Chris, but, uh, but that's kind of where, where we see things going. Yeah, and Chris, I might just add too, I think, uh, and I've said this before, that every project is unique and its proponents are also unique. From our perspective for Shell, Shell Polaris is the first customer of Atlas. So we already have a customer lined up, and it happens to be Shell's emissions because it's part of our strategy to decarbonize Scottford. But it's also a place where we see, again, the supportive government structures that are in place and a great partnership with ATCO, where now we can be one of the first movers to attract those other emitters to be part of our agreement to sequester their emissions. So for us, we also see it as a competitive advantage. And Chris, if I can say, the world is demanding it. Customers will be demanding it more and more. And although here in Canada we have the luxury of having amazing energy opportunities and options, the rest of the world does not. And the rest of the world sees it differently, um, especially in Southeast Asia and other developed areas in Europe. And they, the customers are starting to demand this type of attention. And I think uh, the reality is that these, these companies and others will have their, uh, their opportunity to be first movers and take advantage of that. Okay, so dental health is a major problem, especially for uh, for seniors. And the um, liberal federal government has uh, 
been promising a dental plan to help with this problem. And we're going to hear some updates on how that that um, plan is actually working out from Health Minister Mark Harmon as he appears in Dartmouth, Nova Scotia, uh, and makes an announcement regarding a new process to help ensure that oral health providers can provide care under the federal government's dental care program. So why don't we listen to that uh to to that next as we go to Dartmouth, Nova Scotia. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the Dartmouth Adult Service Center. Um, most people know us by DASC. I'm Faith Scatalone. I'm the chair of the director, uh, board of directors of DASC. And on behalf of our participants, uh, our staff team here at DASC and the board of directors, we'd like to welcome everybody to this event today. We're delighted to be hosting you here at our building at Dory Avenue. And we know that our member of parliament, Darren Fisher, Whenever he can, we'll find an opportunity to highlight DASC and include us in announcements and events. So we very, very much appreciate that um, Mr. Fisher is here today. For those of you who don't know about DASC, I'll just take 30 seconds to tell you that we support the community here in Dartmouth of people with intellectual disabilities. We have about 200 people that we support throughout the year through community employment, social enterprises, recreation, leisure programs, and most of our participants are here at Dory Avenue, about 75 to 80, with a couple of smaller sites uh, out in community centers in Dartmouth. So this announcement today is very, very relevant and important to us. And once again, we really appreciate the opportunity to be hosting you here at Dory Avenue. So with that, I'm going to bring Mr. Fisher up to the podium to uh, take us through today's announcement. Thank you so much, Faith, and, and thank you to you and the board uh, and all the staff members here at DASC. Uh, if you could please uh, send them a very warm thanks for all the work that they do. I'm a huge fan of DASC. Um, I remember going to the old DASC down the street where the hallways were not even wide enough for a wheelchair. So when you get a chance to walk into this building, you get a real uh, feeling of warmth when you walk through here. And hopefully ministers will get a chance to go over and sort of meet some of the folks here. It's uh, it's just an absolutely wonderful, wonderful spot. Um, before we begin, I do want to acknowledge that we are in Mi'kma'ki, the unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people. And I also want to take a quick second to... Uh, Shout out to my friend Hank, the executive director who lost his dad after a 25-year battle with blood cancer. And uh, Hank and I were just chatting the other day about his um, his dad and how he, uh, you know, he lived in uh, under German occupation, you know, and and was there to witness Canadians um, helping to free those people over in Europe. So. It was a it was a bit of an emotional conversation with uh, Hank on text the other night. So Hank, with you, bud. Um, certainly, I am pleased to once again be here at DASC uh, with my two good friends, Jeanette Petipa Taylor and Mark Holland. Um, I made a casual comment to them in the hallway. We have wonderful members of cabinet in Ottawa, but we have two members here in this room, and I'm thrilled to have you in Dartmouth. And by the way, if you see the sun out, you know the weekend has ended. Um, it is a it is a, a terrible trend that I'm seeing early on in the summer of 2024 that the sun comes up first thing Monday morning and the sun disappears uh, midway through Friday afternoon. And that's extremely frustrating. But um, two members of council that and I, I would use this phrase interchangeably with both of them um, doing the right thing for the right reasons, the right way is uh, how I would describe both of these ministers. And again, we have some wonderful ministers, but it's interesting that the two of you would be here today in Dartmouth Cole Harbor, because that is exactly how I see the two of you. So thank you and welcome to, for being here. And, and those of you who are from Dartmouth, um, you know how great it is here in Dartmouth Cole Harbor. And for those of you who aren't 
Um, I'd be happy to chat and give you some uh, business cards from real estate agents from the area. Uh, it is more and more difficult to find a place in Dartmouth because the secret is out, but uh, we'll build you something if we have to. So um, I am, as I said, pleased to be here once again at DASC for a very important conversation on oral health care for Canadians. Um, we've hit the, I believe, and Mark will speak to this and Jeanette will speak to this and probably correct some errors that I make, but we've passed, I believe, the 2 million Canadian mark. 2 million Canadians. And my mother is one of those 2 million who had been, I'd say, delaying dental care for a long time at the expense of other bills. And we're seeing that across the country. So this is a, I will put an asterisk by this being a success story, because as Mark says very often, hard things are hard. These programs don't just start working perfectly. They have wrinkles. They require work. They require effort. And Mark, I have to tell you, you have toured this country back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. I've been with you a couple of times and the work that you've put in is extraordinary because you believe in the program. You believe in providing oral health care to Canadians. And I couldn't ask for a better minister to spread that message across the country while also acknowledging that hard things are hard. National Pharmacare, another program that this minister is working so hard on, something that I've spoken about for eight years. And I will say here in this room, I almost wrote it off thinking it just wasn't going to be possible. Those deals with each province and each territory across the country, those, those negotiations, hard things are hard, but you're doing the hard work and you're doing the heavy lifting. And I want to thank you, Minister Holland, for being here and your team for the work that you've done across the country, not just once, back and forth, back and forth while you keep doing the hard work. Folks, please give a Dartmouth Coal Harbor welcome to my friend, Mark Holland, Minister of my former whip, my former government house leader, but now our uh, our Minister of Health. Mark. Thank you so much, Darren. It's uh, it's an incredible pleasure to be here with you and with Jeanette uh, uh, as we uh, continue this journey in making sure that nine million folks who don't have access to uh, to dental care get the oral health care they need. Uh, let me uh, say to you, Faith, uh, and to uh, everybody, the volunteers and the staff, uh, everybody who works here to do such incredible work, how much we appreciate you hosting us. Um, you know, it's timely because we've just opened up applications, as you know, for folks who are 18 and under uh, and for persons with disabilities. Uh, and so we're seeing a great uptake uh, with people beginning to sign up for that program. And Faith, we had an opportunity to talk about uh, how significant that can be uh, for all Canadians. Um, but, you know, when you think of folks, uh, uh, persons with disabilities who are focusing on uh, making incredible contributions to their communities as they're doing here, um, just like all Canadians, they need less things to worry about. And not being able to afford oral health care or uh, being in a situation where they don't get the care they need uh, means that they can wind up being sick, they can wind up in incredible pain and can pull them away uh, from those contributions uh, that they're making in such an extraordinary place as this. Darren's right. Uh, Darren, who's such a champion of oral health care and pharma care and who uh, I've worked so closely with on these issues, uh, we now have 2.1 million seniors uh, who've signed up. That's out of a potential pool of 3 million. Uh, and you could put that in perspective. Uh, dans les provinces de Québec, par exemple, il y a, uh, sept, uh, y a 700 000 personnes qui, uh, qui, uh, qui, uh, qui peuvent accéder le programme et le nombre de personnes qui sont inscrites dans le programme est exactement, exactement le même chiffre. Et c'est pas un accident quand, quand les noms des euh, de, 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 de dentistes et des autres professionnels est aussi haut que Québec, c'est plus que 60% de, de, des professionnels sont inscrits dans le programme. Euh, c'est le nombre de personnes qui euh, qui sont éligibles qui sont éligibles pour les programmes euh, et c'est ça augmente aussi. And so I look at this and I say, okay, in just over two months, uh, we're close to 50% of providers signing, signed up. 
in very practical terms, that's 250,000 people now who've received services in just two months. Uh, but as Darren said, for uh, Jeanette, Darren, and our entire caucus, it's essential that every provider be signed up in the country. We have an incredible program. Uh, I know uh, we haven't had a chance to say hi, but uh, uh, Dr. McCarr, I believe, is is here in the room. Um, there you are. Yes. And Dr. McCarr uh, and so many other providers are talking about what an exceptionally positive experience this is to be able to see patients in their community who didn't have eligible, uh, eligibility for care who are now getting care. But many providers said to us and dental associations said we want another way to participate, uh, that the uh, the channel of uh, participating uh, because they've had bad experiences with different programs. They wanted to be able to participate on a claim-by-claim claim basis. So we listened. And today, I'm proud to say uh, that the portal to uh, apply on a claim-by-claim claim basis, so there's no formal participation required, is open. Uh, this means that for providers across the country, there's no longer a need to officially participate in the program. You can just try it out, submit a claim, and see what you think. And what we've been able to see is in communities where providers try the program, uh, they're able to talk to other providers and say, actually, this is a fantastic experience. You know, uh, uh, Dr. McCarr has been out uh, explaining to folks that this is something that's easy to use, has less administration than most private plans, uh, and is an incredibly effective way to make sure everybody gets care. And so I'll just talk for a minute about what that means in a practical sense. Uh, you know, I was just uh, in uh, actually Halifax, I guess about a week ago at the Oral Health Summit, and I had an opportunity to talk with so many professionals who said things like, uh, you know, and it was Fern and Ryland and a number of stories they told, but one that Ryland was telling me about uh, somebody who uh, who was getting a new pair of dentures in, in his mouth um, and how when those dentures went in, uh, he came in with a haircut and his best suit and uh, stepped up and put those dentures in his mouth and felt like a million dollars. And that Ryland could see uh, the weight of, of shame from not having teeth in his mouth be lifted. Uh, and that it looked like he had lost 15 years. Uh, and how excited he was to be out in the world, to interact professionally and personally. These are the stories. This is what this means in a very practical sense. Some of it's invisible, yes. You know, a lot of people now are going to get care, and that means they're not going to wind up in an emergency room. It means that they're not going to be struggling with terrible pain. They're going to be able to get the help that they need. That's practically what this is about. So when Darren says, you know, I'm everywhere in the country, I will not stop. Uh, my message is whatever it takes, we have to make sure that everybody gets this care. Because oral health is health, and it is so absolutely essential that we pull that within the rubric of our healthcare system. We have one of the best healthcare systems in the world, but ignoring this means we're leaving all kinds of people resigned to a fate that isn't just fair from a perspective of social justice. It makes absolutely no sense from a perspective of, of, uh, of prevention. So some people say, well, you know, how much is this gonna cost? And we've said it's gonna be $13 billion over the next five years. But how much is it going to prevent? How many hospital visits are going to be avoided? How many people are going to feel more confident going into that job interview because they've got a set of teeth in their mouth or being able to walk in their community and feel like they can participate more, or maybe volunteer in a way that they couldn't before? Fundamentally, this is about the kind of country that we live in. And so it is why uh, we want to work very closely with providers to show them this is I think, a remarkable uh, construct. Uh, it only works when they participate uh, voluntarily and are having a positive experience, which means that this program is designed to work best when we work together. Today is a concrete illustration of that. I look forward to doing more as we push to see that nearly 50% become 60%, 70%, until in the near future, we're no longer asking the question of who's participating. We're talking about all the people who are getting care. And with that, it's my uh, great privilege to introduce my friend and colleague, Jeanette Petipot Taylor.
Merci beaucoup, Mark. Thank you so much, Mark. And always great to be here in the beautiful writing of Dartmouth Cole Harbour with my friend and colleague, Darren. So thank you so much for hosting us today as well, Darren. And to Faith and Ashley, thank you so much for opening your doors to us. It sounds like you're doing some incredible work with the participants here. So thank you again for, for hosting us today. Mark, it's always wonderful to be here with you, uh, especially to share uh, this good news. I also want to take a moment, as I've indicated, to thank the Dartmouth Adult Service Centre for hosting us today. And I'm truly looking forward to hopefully being able to have a, a quick visit after the announcement is done. Uh, I am told that your mission to support the being, the well-being and the belonging of becoming adults with intellectual disabilities is so important to our communities. And thank you for the tremendous work that you do day in and day out. It's always great as well to be home in Atlantic Canada to deliver some good news about the Canadian Dental Care Plan and also called the CDCP. As of last week, parents or legal guardians of children under the age of 18 can now apply online for the CDCP on behalf of their children. I'm happy to say that adults with a valid disability tax credit certificate can also apply and are eligible. Cela signifie encore que presque 1.2 million de Canadiens et Canadiennes supplémentaires auront bientôt accès à des examens de santé bucco-dentaire et à des traitements dentaires plus abordables. This means that close to 1.2 million more Canadians will soon have access to more affordable oral health checkups and dental treatment. J'aimerais également rappeler que les personnes âgées de 65 ans et plus peuvent continuer à présenter une demande en ligne au RCSD et que tous les autres résidents canadiens admissibles âgés de 18 à 64 ans pourront aussi présenter une demande à partir de 2025. I would also like to remind everyone that seniors 65 years and older can continue to apply online for the CDCP and that all remaining eligible Canadian residents between the ages of 18 and 64 will be able to apply in 2025. This historic public plan will eventually cover, as Mark indicated, 9 million Canadian residents and families income below $90,000 who don't have access to dental insurance. Let's just take a moment and think about that. That's roughly the combined population of Toronto, of Montreal, of Winnipeg, of Calgary, and Vancouver included. Now, let me tell you about the application process. And as Mark has indicated, we certainly want to make sure that it is simple and easy. We've made applying for the process as easy as possible. The online application form is convenient and easy to use. If you need assistance, you can absolutely get in touch. Um, you can apply for for the CDCP with the help of a trusted person or a delegate. Mais je tiens aussi à souligner notre approche numérique d'abord ne signifie pas que c'est uniquement numérique. I also want to emphasize that our digital first approach does not mean digital only because we certainly recognize that some seniors don't have access or perhaps don't use computers. So for those who need ex um, ex extra help to apply, Service Canada agents are available to facilitate access to either in person or over the phone. And I personally can tell you that when my father-in-law received his notice in the mail, he was the first to be at the Service Canada office in Moncton and did his formal application. La santé bucco-dentaire est un élément important de la santé et du mieux-être général de la population canadienne. Il est prouvé que des visites régulières chez un fournisseur de soins bucco-dentaire réduisent le risque de carie dentaire, de maladies gencives, et d'autres problèmes de santé graves, tels que des maladies cardiovasculaires et des accidents vasculaires cérébraux. Oral health is a part of Canada's overall health and well-being. Regular visits to an oral health provider have proven to reduce the risk of tooth decay, gum disease, and other serious health problems, such as cardiovascular diseases and strokes. So the announcement that Minister Holland has made today means that more people, many more people, will have access to the care and the support that they need. More seniors, more adults with disabilities, and more children. And I have to say, that's the kind of country that I'm proud to say that we live in. So once again, Mark, thank you so much for being us here today. And I think that... Okay, and this next segment, uh, we're going to hear from the Green Party uh, with Elizabeth May and Jonathan Pinault as he announces he is stepping down from his position uh, for personal reasons. And he, um, Pinault, uh, won the leadership party, uh, leadership of the party in November 2022 on a partnership ticket 
thicket with Elizabeth May, who previously served as leader from 2026 to 2019 for the Green Party, and he ran unsuccessfully in his federal by-election in Montreal, riding of Notre Dame de Grace, uh, Westmont in uh, June of 2023. So again, he's stepping away for personal reasons. Um, it, let's hear uh, if he actually uh, gives any more detail to that. Merci à tous d'être ici aujourd'hui. Thank you everyone for being here today. Uh, this may be a bit of a, a surprise. I think there was a lot of speculation over the past couple of hours, uh, but I am actually here to announce my resignation as uh, deputy leader of the Green Party of Canada for personal reasons. It's been uh, the honor of a lifetime to serve alongside Elizabeth May and Mike Morris, two outstanding members of Parliament who dedicate their every waking hours to uh, Canadians uh, in a way that sadly partisan politics today in Ottawa uh, doesn't quite exemplify. Uh, I think uh, uh, when I decided to come back to this country after 14 years in conflict areas, uh, working to advance the cause of peace and human rights, it was very clear to me that this country was uh, on the pathway that is uh, fairly dangerous. Uh, there's a lot of things we take for granted in this country. Uh, my departure today is for personal reasons. I won't be uh, providing uh, further comments on that, but I do want to say that uh, Greens throughout the country continue to exemplify what politics should be about, collaboration, uh, hard work, uh, and mo most importantly, a commitment to this country and its citizens, uh, something that I think other parties could very well learn from. Uh, je suis ici pour annoncer aujourd'hui ma démission uh, en tant que chef adjoint du Parti vert du Canada. Uh, ça a été l'honneur d'une vie uh, de servir aux côtés d'Elisabeth May puis de Mike Morris, deux uh, députés extraordinaires qui dédient toute leur, uh, toute leur, uh, chaque heure de leur jour uh, et de leur journée pour uh, servir leurs concitoyens. Uh, quelque chose que je crois que bien d'autres politiciens uh, pourraient prendre exemple uh, uh, sur Elisabeth et Mike. Um, ça, a été, uh, ça a été une expérience uh, Extraordinaire de pouvoir servir à leur côté. Euh, quand je suis revenu au Canada après 14 ans en zone de conflit pour euh, servir euh, euh, comme chef euh, adjoint, c'était pour moi important de rappeler aux Canadiens qu'on est dans un moment assez extraordinaire sur la scène internationale et domestiquement. On est en route vers des tendances qui sont dangereuses et difficiles. Euh, je pense que ça va être important que les progressistes euh, d'un océan à l'autre euh, s'unissent et qu'on fasse euh, front euh, face à la montée, malheureusement, des extrêmes. Euh, la décision que je prends aujourd'hui, elle est personnelle. Je ne ferai pas plus de commentaires sur cette euh, décision. Euh, et sur ce, euh, je vais passer la parole à notre chef, Elisabeth May. Et pour la dernière fois, je veux dire un grand merci publiquement à mon chef adjoint, mon cher ami Jonathan Pedno. Il a dit que c'est un honneur de travailler avec moi. C'est un grand honneur pour moi de travailler, travailler avec lui. Jonathan Pedno is an extraordinary, extraordinary young man with depth, courage, and integrity and approached this decision, uh, as he said, for personal reasons and I'll respect that they are his reasons and that I am disappointed, to put it mildly, to lose his role in a shared leadership effort. I'm, I remain committed to the path that uh, the Green Party is on internally for constitutional reform, to constitutionally address the issue of co-leadership and why it is a preferable course. I reflected on this uh, as I watched my friends, and as the leadership of the Greens of England and Wales, finally, finally make a breakthrough from the one seat that Carolyn Lucas had won back in 2010 in Brighton Pavilion to four seats with, with uh, the kind of coverage they, the, in The Guardian that crisscrossing the country as a duo, they covered so much ground that Carla and Adrian, Carla did, is just won her seat in Bristol, first time the Greens have won there. It was a, traditionally a strong Labour seat. Adrian Ramsey's run a seat. On the other hand, in rural and very hardcore conservative territory. So four seats in England and Wales. I remain confident that the Greens in Canada 
offer the voters something that they want, which is an authentic voice with real integrity on the national stage. Uh, leadership questions are besetting, I think, parties around the world. And just as Jonathan said, we're in a situation where the rise of some kinds of leaders, populist, um, the, the changes that we've seen in jettisoning the, jettisoning the status quo is the one common denominator. You can't say there's a rise of right-wing politics when the UK just went to labor. On the other hand, you can say there's a disgust with the status quo wherever you are. Uh, Macron certainly uh, did not receive public support. The ability of Greens in France to ally with parties that are traditionally enemies to make sure we run a lot of green seats for uh, uh, green candidates in France in the last election it, it, as part of a, of a combined effort to deny the hard right in France any chance of forming majority government. Around the world, there are leadership questions. There are leadership questions in Canada. There are leadership questions, certainly, in the United States. For, for Greens in Canada, there remain questions about the structure and internal governance for the party that will be addressed, so make that clear. The special general meeting that was postponed recently will be taking place. We will be addressing issues of co-leadership. That doesn't drop, even though I'm heartbroken that um, my partner with whom I entered the leadership race two years ago, uh, and I remain leader of the Green Party of Canada. That's, that's the official title I have, even though Jonathan and I were and I remain committed to the, the concept of co-leadership and, in fact, finding another co-leader before the next election campaign, assuming that the steps that are before us are taken. It's always in the hands of the members of the Green Party of Canada what amendments are made, what structure is put in place. Anyway, there's no point in saying more now, just to say that Jonathan's decision is his decision. I respect him. I love him. I couldn't have asked for a better partner, a better sounding board, a better voice for so many core issues that face Canadian society, particularly issues of inequality, income distribution, the assets of the of corporate power in Canada that have, what have they? Doubled. Doubled in 10 years? 10 years. It, it's an incredible reality that we don't talk about in this country is that we've become a more unequal society, a more unfair society. And we remain committed as Greens to justice, to fairness, to climate action. Those are all givens. And the, in some ways, this press conference announces very few changes. But that doesn't mean I'm not heartbroken that Jonathan is resigning his position as my deputy leader. To be super clear, our other deputy leader, Rainbow Eyes, who's appealing a conviction for opposing the destruction of old growth forests and stands sentenced for 51 days in jail while her appeal continues, uh, she has our full support and she remains deputy leader. I think that covers off all possibilities of what might be hypothetically changing. I'm running for parliament in Saanich Gulf Islands and I really will be as committed as ever to making sure that our party is ready for the election whenever it happens. Thank you. Merci. Thank you. We'll now proceed to the question period. Uh, let's start with uh, Jesse from the Hill Times. Uh, yes. Um, so do you have any, uh, anything you'd like to say about uh, accomplishments or uh, regrets uh, now that you'll be stepping down? I think Elizabeth and I uh, took over a party that was in a difficult spot, uh, whether it's in terms of fundraising, in terms of public uh, image, and we, uh, we've worked very hard with, uh, with our membership to stabilize uh, the party after what has been undoubtedly a, a pretty difficult time for, uh, for all Greens. Uh, so I'm very proud of that. I'm very proud of the work that Elizabeth and Mike have continued to do uh, in the House of Commons, defending uh, the interests of their constituents. Elizabeth, of course, has passed her third uh, private member's bill. Uh, Mike Morris has been one of the most, uh, one of the most vocal advocates uh, on defending uh, people with disabilities and, and, and calling for a Canada disability benefit, uh, something that uh, sadly we're 
we're sad to see not being fully funded. Uh, and uh, so, so it, yeah, in many ways, I think that, that, you know, the work of Greens in Parliament has been exemplary. Uh, Elizabeth and I have been touring the country, meeting with Greens, rebuilding one step at a time, or as Elizabeth likes to say, one hug at a time. Uh, it's hard work, uh, and it's work that I'm very proud to have accomplished over the past uh, year and a half alongside Elizabeth. Okay, uh, thank you for listening today. And final thoughts. We're still watching mass destruction happen um, in several areas of, of, of the world. Um, of course, we've been focusing mostly on uh, Ukraine and, of course, Gaza. As the Israeli government, um, after October 7, 2023, um, has pretty much just romped straight through uh, Gaza and leaving the, in its wake a um, massive wave of destruction and refugees behind. The, th the thing uh, in both areas with uh, both the, the uh, Russian uh, Russian um, aggression and the Israeli aggression is the idea that civilian sites have been attacked and civilian um, shall we say um, collateral damage that has resulted in civilian loss of life we're not going to say that it's that it's intentional. We're not going to quite go go quite that way, um, but we are going to say that there has been significant um, collateral damage leading to the loss of civilian lives, which is something that is not supposed to be allowed. Military actions are supposed to ensure that civilians are kept safe and that the fighting stays away from children and targets such as hospitals and especially children's hospitals are just simply are off the table. There are should not be any combatants in a hospital. They're giving care to those who are sick. How can they fight? So, um, but moving on to, to other things that were talked about, um, a, a dental plan for, um, the, for the, our seniors is a much needed thing. Uh, oral health is something that is extremely important to our lives. Our oral health is our first line of defense in our immune system, and with our pr protecting our teeth and protecting um, gum disease and things like that, that we can live a happier and, and a more purposeful life when we have a healthy mouth. So uh, our hopes that that. Uh, um, the Minister of Health actually manages to get a lot of the changes put through so that people can have easy access to dental care. So, you've been listening to Policy and Rights here on Depictions Media Radio. I've been your host, Michael Cloggs, and just help us spread the love. So click that subscribe button and throw us some support if you can. Um, in the link that's in the show notes.
This show has been produced by Depictions Media. Please contact us at depictions.media for more information.